morning. We are studying the book of Isaiah, and of course, because we are, I want you to turn first to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles uh, is behind Samuel and Kings, and it's not too terribly hard to find. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. We're going to review this because we're going to talk again about Isaiah's commission and what he was doing, what his responsibility was. So let me remind you that, that the prophet Isaiah had a calling. It was his job. It was his responsibility. Um, it was his ministry. It is who he is. He is the voice of God to the nation of Israel, to the kings, and to the priests. Um, and we talked about the Civil War. We talked about the different uh, kings that, um, well, we didn't really get into Israel, but into Judah, the southern kingdom. And we talked about what a good king Uzziah was. But I also want to, I want to set the tone for the mission that God is going to put Isaiah in. And so we're going to start with 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And it says, it's talking about King Uzziah, which is when Isaiah began to uh, perform his duty as prophet. So talking about King Uzziah, it says, But when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. Now that's a big deal because that is not the job of the king. That's the job of the priest. Azariah, the high priest, went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men. Now, you have to be brave to enter into the temple and go after the king and tell him he's not doing the right thing. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron who are set apart for this work. Remember the priests are, it's genealogically determined. Um, your father's a priest, your grandfather's a priest. It's determined by the line that you are born into. Not so with the prophet who is called, called out specifically to do his job. And they, they tell him, get out of the sanctuary for you have sinned. The Lord God will not honor you for this. We find out that Uzziah becomes furious. Um, and in this uh, confrontation, Uzziah is stricken with leprosy, with, with a, a rash that covers his entire body. So when the high priest and the other priests see this, this mark, punishment from God perhaps, they rush him out. And it says, and the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. Hey, guess what? I did the wrong thing. I'm being punished. So King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house for he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. And so for the last years of his life, he governed the people along with his son, um, who then, of course, becomes king in fullness after the death of Uzziah. So if we turn then to um, chapter 6 of Isaiah, we covered this very quickly and incompletely last week because I ran out of time. So we're going to go back and do some housekeeping duties. Um, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it tells us, 
It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. Now who's talking? Isaiah. Isaiah sees the Lord. Now, can you just think about that for a second? No man saw the Lord. Um, it was forbidden. But look at this vision that uh, Isaiah sees. He says, I was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six, six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. And the entire building was filled with smoke. Now, a lot of words. If, if we were together in person, I would say, what words come out to you from, from those four verses? And since you can't talk to me, I'll just tell you what I thought. First off, I thought about God being high and being lifted up and the fact that his presence filled the temple completely, that he was exalted, that he is the supreme ruler. That principle existed 1500 BC. It still exists today. He's the greatest. It's a mystery. How all this happened is beyond what my feeble brain can understand the power of God and the majesty of God. Um, Isaiah is put in this position facing God. And he is supposed to tell the people who believe that they were blessed by God because they were his special people. His job is going to be to tell them that God was going to destroy them because of their disobedience, it would definitely take a vision from God for someone to have that type of ability or that, that type of strength to understand that job and then, and then to do it. Uh, quickly, we we didn't talk too much about the seraphim. They're angels. The word seraphim comes from a Hebrew word which means to burn. Um, so I think they're, they're heavenly beings of um, praise. But they also are beings of destruction. Um, Covering their eyes, perhaps they just couldn't look at God. Maybe they can't look at God. Um, maybe they, their feet are covered uh, because, uh, you know, if you fall prostrate at God's feet, then, then it's showing um, worship. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, but I do know that they, they call him holy and they emphasize. Not, he's not just holy, but he's holy, holy, holy. He is morally perfect and pure. And God's glory fills the entire earth. Um, I have to tell you, that when I think about this, when I, when I, I look at this, um, the whole earth is filled with His glory, I think about the daily frustrations that we have. This coronavirus is driving us all crazy. We're all lonesome. We all, you know, we face society's pressures. We have, we have 
really a narrow view of God. Because we need to realize as Christians um, that this is God's earth and everything is under his control. Everything. Um, so let's, let's not um, lose track of that thought. Verse 5 is my favorite because Isaiah said, and I, I'm reading out of the New Living Version. He says, so he, he sees God and he says, it's all over. I'm doomed for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among people with filthy lips. Now, I gotta tell you, I read that like I was reading it, but can you imagine how Isaiah must have said this? Uh, it's all over. No kidding. I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine standing in the presence of power. Um, and so he says, here I am. I'm filthy. I live among people with filthy lips, and yet I've seen the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies. Um, he knows that God cannot be in the presence of uncleanness, and He immediately feels the weight of His sin. There's an immediate acknowledgement of, um, of His mouth. No must have been his main problem. Um, so one of the seraphim flew to him with a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongues. Now why burning coal? Because he's purifying Isaiah. He's taking away that sin. He's purifying him for this message. Um, and he said, he touched my lips with it and said, see, this cold has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. And I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? The Lord is asking this. Of course, you know who he's aiming it at. Isaiah. But Isaiah has to respond. And Isaiah says, it doesn't say immediately, but he says, here I am. Send me. And the Lord responds, and yes, say, yes, go save the people. Now, I, I, I thought that was interesting because um, Jeremiah and Moses and Jonah and some of the greatest prophets prior to this hesitated. They had excuses. Um, but Isaiah immediately responds, and he says, I will go. I don't know if it was the the touch of that purification, um, but he immediately said, I will go. And, and this is um, interesting because in verse 9 it says, and he said, yes, go and say to this people, listen carefully, but do not understand. Listen, watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way, they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. Now, i got to tell you, I don't understand this, because I'm thinking, um, let me see how much time I've got left. I'm sorry. Um, why are we telling them if their hearts are going to be hardened and they don't understand. Um, verse 13 explains, explains it. Well, first, let's, let's go back to 11 because Isaiah says, well, Lord, how long, how long is this going to go on? Uh, you know, I kind of think like Jonah did. Well, if I go to all this trouble to do this, you know, let's get it done pretty quick so that I, I look okay. But Isaiah's response is, well, you know, how long is this going to go on? And the Lord responds until their towns are empty and their houses are deserted and the whole country is a wasteland. Until the Lord has sent everyone away and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. 
But here's the key. Here's the important part because in verse 13, we need to underline the word remnant. It says, if even a tenth or a remnant survive, it will be invaded again and burned. But there is a terebinth or oak tree leaves a stump where it is cut down. So Israel's stump will be a holy seed. If, if I uh, weed my flower garden, or weed flower garden, I promise you the weeds come up quicker than the, than the flowers do. And that's what he's saying. He will leave a remnant of Israel who remembers what God is. Now, that sounds harsh. So let's go back to, to, to uh, chapter 1 because chapter 1 is going to, going to explain why God has pronounced this judgment and why Isaiah has been called in this time to do this. So if we look in Isaiah chapter 1, I know you can't believe we're finally here in chapter 1. Um, the first part, and we're, we're honestly going to finish this entire chapter here in the next 10 minutes. Um, we have a message um, from God through Isaiah to the nation. Verse 1. Here are the problems. These are the visions that Isaiah, son of Amos, and it is Amos, not Amos, the other prophet, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the southern part, the southern kingdom. He saw these visions during the years of Uzziah, Joab, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Ahaz, remember, was the worst. Um, Hezekiah was a good king. Though he, he like Uzziah, had, had his problems. But this was, this was a time of, um, of, of good for the people. Uh, they had issues, but, you know, they had cars in the garage and... 401k, it was working pretty good. And so they, they thought things were okay. Verse 2. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. So this is Isaiah repeating. And, and, and it's almost like he's in court. And he's, he's explaining the charges against the nation. He says, The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. And then he uses some really common sense illustrations. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Oh, what a sinful nation they are, loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil people, corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Uh, I wish that you would take your pencil and underline the, the condition of the nation. Real quickly look at it. First off, we have the word rebellion. Um, we, have, we have ignorance. They don't, even, they don't even know their master. They don't recognize what God has done for them. There's no gratitude in their life. Um, they're evil. They're corrupt. And they have rejected the Lord, the Lord who has cared for them and protected them. They have despised God. In fact, they turn their backs on Him. They don't even acknowledge Him. Boy, that sounds like another country I know. Um, so they present, they present this case against him. Uh, why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured, your heart is sick, you're battered from head to foot, covered with bruises, welts, and infected wounds without any soothing ointments or bandages. You realize the... Um, the healing for our hearts and the healing for our nation and for our families and for our churches 
come from God. We're looking in other places, but it comes from God. And, and He is the one who has the, the soothing ointments or bandages, and yet they don't pay attention. Uh, foreigners plunder your fields before your eyes and destroy everything they see. Beautiful Jerusalem stands abandoned like a watchman's shelter in a vineyard and a lean-to in a cucumber field after the harvest like a helpless city under siege. They're, they're being destroyed and they, they're either too stupid or too ignorant to acknowledge it or they just, they just don't realize who is responsible for the answer. So, if the Lord of Heaven's armies had not prepared a few of us, we would have been wiped out like Sodom and destroyed like Gomorrah. Here's that remnant again that's going to exist. Uh, and, and you can't get any more wicked than Sodom or Gomorrah. So he's telling them they're at their very worst. Um, Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. And then here's some of the saddest verses ever. Yahweh, God, had set up a system of um, worship to remind the people, to keep them straight. And look what he says. What makes you think I want all of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I'm sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatty cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who asks you to parade through my courts with your ceremony? Boy, if this next verse doesn't say it all, stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. Worship without love, worship without an acknowledgement of God's gift insults him. And he is insulted. All of the celebrations, the Sabbath, the most holy day of the week, the days of fasting have become, because of their hearts and their attitude, sinful. And false. I got to tell you, folks, you can come to church all the time. You can do everything the church asks you to do. And if it's not from a sincere love and desire to serve God, it means nothing. He says, I want no more of your pious meetings. There's nothing worse than somebody who is so religious that they left love and God out of their religion. We're not going to get through chapter one of it. Well, that won't make me think that. Let me, let me check my time. I'm sorry. Um, verse 17, learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Can I tell you that Isaiah is the first prophet, um, I, I'm going to use a word here that society has taken and sort of changed the meaning of, but social justice, for us to care for the people who don't have. Um, I, 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 a word I like better than social justice is an ethical religion. Let's not just talk about what's wrong with the world or what's wrong with our culture, but let's go about seeking how we can fix it, how we can teach people about Jesus. Um, Jerusalem has been so unfaithful. Um, I, I want to go because I'm, I'm really running out of time. Um, verses 18 through 20. A couple of things I want you to, two words I want you to notice, though and if. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Here, here's Isaiah saying, okay, here's how we can make this right. 
Though your sins be like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though, circle that, though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If, if you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. He gives them this contrast. Here's what it is. But if, if you allow me, I will keep my promises to you. The promises are from God himself. Verses 21 through 23, he talks about the unfaithfulness of Jerusalem. And i got to tell you, I, I put a, tried to put a time frame with this, and I, it's past, present, and future. Um, what is the promise to those who repent? And what is the promise to those who don't repent? Oh, and he gives such great examples. Um, Jerusalem was once so faithful, has become a prostitute. In some verses it says a whore. Um, once a home of justice and righteousness, she's now filled with murderers. You got that? Once pure like silver, it's become worthless. Your leaders are rebels and companions of thieves. Folks, you can't rule a nation like that. They love bribes. They love payoffs. They refuse to defend the cause of orphans or fight for the rights of widows. God promises them in 24 that he's going to take it back, that he's going to take revenge, and he is going to. He said, I will melt you down and skim off your slag. Um, there's a punishment. There are consequences coming. The strongest among you will disappear like straw. But guess what? Chapter 2 is the Lord's future plan. And we begin next week, I promise, we're going to begin the millennial reign of Jesus and the return of God when things are good and right. And all of Isaiah is not as depressing as the chapter 1, but it's our fault when we behave this way. So I'll see you next week. Thanks.